What do you call that noise? The XTC Podcast. What do you call that noise? Hello, you're listening to What Do You Call That Noise, the XTC Podcast, as featured in a very recent edition of the Swindon Advertiser. I always think we've made it. I've made it once I've got into the Swindon Advertiser. So welcome to all our listeners, new and old. My name is Mark Fisher, and today we're in birthday mode. Uh, gated reverb at the ready because this episode is a celebration of the 40th anniversary of Black Sea, which was released on the 12th of September 1980. It was actually the first XTC album I waited for, having become a fan with Drums and Wires the previous year. And I can still remember getting it on that first day of release, complete with its green paper bag. And here we are 40 years later with two very special guests who I'll uh, introduce in a minute. Uh, but before I do, I need to say that the XTC podcast is brought to you by our generous supporters on Patreon, who include Pink Things, Humble Daisies and Nights in Shining Karma. Thanks very much for, much for keeping us going. And thank you in particular to the following Nights in Shining Karma, who are Murray Meikle, Liam Duggan, Leslie Gooch, Amy Parkinson, Liz Lynch, Simon Slateholm, Robert Graham, Dennis LaCourier, Michael Sutcliffe, Nigel Waller, Mark Reed, William Wilkstrom. Thank you very much for that. And if you'd like to support the XDC podcast, and why wouldn't you, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Mark Fisher. And if you'd like to read my XDC books, you can do that as well by going to xdclimelight.com. I've also got to give a quick thank you to Nuno Veloso in Chile for oiling the wheels of this particular podcast. And I'd like to introduce now uh, my podcasters, in XTC nurse, David White. Hello, David. Hi there, Mark. And uh, Mark Reed. Hello. And then our very special guest, uh, Dave Gregory. How are you, Dave? Welcome back to the XTC podcast. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. And to Hugh Padgham, your first time, but I'm hoping it's not going to be your last time because we've got lots to talk about. Hi, Hugh. Hello. How are you? Well, I'm great. Thank you very much. And delighted that you can join us. Um, D Dave Gregory is well known in these in these parts, and I think Hugh, Hugh is also well known in these parts. But just to fill you in, uh, d in fact, Hugh only today has been talking about some of the biggest songs in, in the, from the 1980s that he was involved as a producer and also as an engineer. His name is attached to records by The Police, by Sting. Phil Collins, Genesis, Peter Gabriel, The Human League, Paul McCartney, McFly, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about McFly, Kate Bush, Julian Cope, Suzanne Vega, Yusu Ndua, Split Ends, Brian Wilson and The Waitresses. And uh, The Waitresses is an interesting one because Chris Butler is a uh, very enthusiastic fan of XTC and indeed turns up in what do you call that noise, the XTC Discovery Book. They are so fucking Good. Hugh, I think we could start with you because um, you, on, on the very, very touchingly, I think, on the liner notes of the Stephen Wilson re-release of Black Sea, uh, you say that Black Sea is such an amazing album, no one has ever really asked me about my involvement in it. And uh, so here we're, here we're finally catching up with you to ask you what your involvement was. With, with it was, but it occurs to me that um, back then in 1980, you were only 25, I believe, and I wonder then, and you know, that list of names of albums I've just, uh, and, and artists I've just listed off, uh, were all people that I think pretty much that you moved on to. Does it feel, does, does Black Sea, and I suppose in its turn, Drums and Wires, uh, and then English Settlement, do, 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 does, it, does Black Sea feel like an, a formative album to you? Uh, yeah, I kind of, remember i mean xtc was was the first sort of band that i really recorded that had sort of good success because the year before we did drums and wires and the townhouse where i was working then was was quite new and um i would only have been 24 then so to have um you know i mean X, what i'm trying to say <laughs> in a very roundabout way, is XTC are my fondest band because they were really the first band I worked with that had, you know, that, that was successful for me as, well, I was the engineer on, on, on Drums and Wires and Black Sea and then helped produce um, English Settlement as well. So it, it has always, well, I still think XTC are one of the best bands ever. We're not going to disagree with you that. Um, Dave, in in a similar way, this was also a similar stage for, for, for your career, because although you'd had lots of experience in the semi-pro music, musician world, this was technically your second album, or, or third if you include Peter Gabriel 3. Uh, did... did does it place? Does it take a, a similar place in in your affections? 
Well, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, as you say, second XTC album. I wasn't sure that I was going to get to second base with that band, you know, <laughs> because when I joined, it was very much to keep the wheels rolling. And uh, we did drums and wires and we all had a good time making it, thanks largely to Hugh and to Steve Lillywhite who oiled the wheels and just made it as painless as possible. We were only in the studio for a few weeks to do that record. And then we off we went on tour and we had a hit single off it. And so I guess because of that, they decided to keep me on. And uh, so we came to do the next album, Black Sea. And uh, it was just, yeah, fantastic. I, was, I thought, finally, I'm a, I'm a member of this band. I, I remember they put off signing me to the contract until just before the album sessions began for Black Sea. So I'd been kind of on probation for a year because uh, I don't think any of us really knew what, what to expect, you know, how, how the thing was going to, whether it was actually going to fly or not with me on board. Did you get paid anything? Uh, not personally. <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody did. It's At that time, percent. nobody yeah. did. Uh, we don't know where it all went. There wasn't that much of it. Most of it was... Um, you know, spent on studio costs and paying producers and so on. You, oh, of course, yeah. So we, um... no, I didn't. I didn't cost you anything because I was I was staff engineer at the townhouse. Oh, so, you... so the engineer came free with the sessions. That's right, he did. Well, sorry, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to um, impugn your uh, your status, Hugh, or even imply that uh, because of you, we were skint. No, quite the contrary. That record sold well. We had more hit songs off uh, off the back of Black Sea. Actually, we had a lot of XTC. We were so busy in 1980. The album was just a sort of um, a bit of time off from the road because we'd gone to America and done this long, dreadful tour. It lasted about six or seven weeks. And then almost as soon as we returned to England, we were expected to produce a second, uh, and sorry, fourth album, as it turned out. And that would have been, that was the Black Sea uh, sessions. And I, I note from my notes... Rehearsals for that record began on the 1st of May, 1980. That's really the starting point for the record. And um, and we actually had, the um, first job we had to do, largely as a result of touring in the States, we were invited to contribute a song to a movie that Robert Stigwood was pr uh, producing called Times Square. And they needed a song for this movie. And it turned out, and he just, you know, wrote this song especially called Take This Town. And so Virgin Records booked the townhouse again and Steve and Hugh as well. And we went in and did that. But, but Andy, of course, and Colin, they couldn't, it wasn't enough to just to go in and do one song. They had to do a song each, you know, just to make most of the studio time or the opportunity. So we did Take This Town. Rocket from a Bottle and Love at First Sight. And all three were considered as being contenders as the next single. But we only had a weekend to do it. Saturday the 10th of May it was when, when that was, 10th, 11th of May. And I've got a feeling mixing those songs <laughs> took until about six o'clock on the Monday morning. Did, did we never remix them? Yes, they were remixed, Hugh. Yeah, and, and some of them were overdubbed as well i think we redid vocals on both of the love at first sight and rocket from a bottle because i was listening the other day to rocket from a bottle and i didn't think it sounded as good as some of the other songs sound wise i thought the vocals quite sort of buried in it i'm not sure i can't it's such i can't remember what was changed i'm not because you know i just it just became part of the uh, black sea album it wasn't until, as I say, I looked at these notes and I realised that two of the songs on it had been recorded prior to the album. Yeah. And and can I ask you a question, Dave? Sorry, guys, I hope I'm not sort of taking over here. No, no, no. But in, Hugh, at any, at any point. Did Andy and Colin write the songs for Black Sea when you were on the road touring? I don't know when they wrote them. I don't know when they found, found time to write. Because to write that many pretty excellent songs, some more than excellent, in only a year from when, pretty well a year, wasn't it, from when we recorded Drums and Wires? Yep. Straight on the road, touring, you know, the, the hits off that record or whatever you, you know, you, whatever you want to call it, to then, you know, because I remember when I worked with David Bowie many years, 
well, not many years, but several years later. And we went into the studio soon after he had had success with Let's Dance. And he couldn't write on the road. And, and I, you know, I think, well, everybody thinks in a way that we went into the studio underprepared and with substandard songs and stuff to to come in after a a year and and then next going on to English settlement was only a year after um Black Sea pretty well and that was a double album also with lots of amazing songs so it's it's a pretty good testament to how you guys you know got it together don't you think? And if you look at that, there's a website called Optimism's Flames that Dave contributed a list of of uh, gigs that they played. And if you look at you, so you can see the whole of 1980 if you go to it, and it's just absolutely phenomenal. You you can't work out when they could. You can like the the dates that Dave has already quoted are, are literally the only dates you could possibly have gone into the studio because everything else is is playing live. And 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 I, I think Andy and Colin have both told me that they didn't find being on the road are conducive to writing songs. They needed to be at home to do it. So I, f- I find it remarkable to imagine how they could have done anything. Yeah. No, Andy must have been writing songs in his sleep because he could just, um, it, it just, uh, he had, you probably remember his notebooks, Hugh. He had this, uh, a notebook full of lyrical ideas and drawings. And uh, I mean, every time he was just uh, inspired by whatever it was, uh, he do a doodle, he'd write a few lines, he'd come up with a song title or a, or a design for something. Uh, and he used to say, every time I write a song, I design um, I design a, a sleeve for the single. Just in case it's a single, I always do a sleeve design as well. So it was just unstoppable. Uh, Colin wasn't quite as prolific, but give him his due, he came up with some really good melodies and some good song ideas and although he did used to grumble at times that he didn't get fair crack of the whip when it came to, you know, portioning the, the, the songs per album, you know. But then again, you know, Andy was writing three times as much as he was. It was and it was all quality stuff. Colin wrote Making Plans for Nigel, didn't he? He did. And that song probably, you know, brought more people uh, to our doorstep than, than maybe most of the others, maybe Senses Working Overtime would have brought a lot, uh, quite a few, until the, at least until the Skylarking album. That really, that's what broke us in America, if break is the right word. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly, you know, we owe Nigel big time. But then again, you remember, Hugh, it was, it, it was more than a song. It was a band. We worked that song up. From the ground, you know, Colin you just brought it in on acoustic guitars, and here's the melody, strummed the chords on acoustic guitar. Andy and Terry, between them, came up with that back to front drum pattern, and the little guitar ideas. Andy and I sort of did did those things. Colin was sort of the pumping, ended up pumping eights on his bass. It was a band production, and I think without the, all four of us. Uh, it wouldn't have been as successful as it was. But, uh, you know, it's not to take anything away from Colin. It's his, it's his song. No, but but from my point of view, and, and probably from Steve's as well, we never saw that because we didn't attend your rehearsals. You used to come to the studio with the songs pretty well ready to go as were recorded that we we never did that much fiddling around with the songs or or arrangements in the studio did we no because they didn't that by the time we got to the studio you know the clock was ticking exactly and we knew that we had to if we wanted all these songs to be recorded if we wanted to make this album the way we heard it or, or at least get all the material ready we had to be prepared we had to work there was going to be no chance of uh you know spending half the studio budget down the pub that wasn't part of our agenda um so yeah rehearsals were it was pretty much you know we used to we used to gather down at touch um for this record and we did we rehearsed at a place called tudor studios in swindon it was a little demo studio nice little place perfect for rehearsing we'd have we'd spend all day there we'd each go in with our cassette recorders and as soon as a song was almost, you know, at a point where we could work, develop it, we'd press record, take the cassette home with us, come back the next day, having thought about it and listened to it in 3D, as it were. And then we'd embellish or we'd say, yep, that's ready to record now. But it wouldn't be ready to record until we were all happy with uh, 
with, with what we'd rehearsed. Occasionally that would be updated again in the studio when we got there, but we went in with enough information here to, to, to make a record. As far as Steve and I were concerned, if a song was sung by Colin, we thought it was written by Colin, and if a song was sung by Andy, it was written by Andy. That's right. So we did, we, right. Ne- we never saw the whole band, um, you know, f- formulating the song and how it, you know, the genesis of, of each song and stuff. That's right. No, it, it, it was because um, this, this is where a lot of bands end up fighting with each other. This songwriter credit, the little name in parenthesis under the song title on the label, ooh, that can create an awful lot of problems with bands. And bands have broken up as a result of, uh, you know, the classic example is Mike Love and Brian Wilson, when Brian Wilson pretty much assumed compositional rights on all the early songs that he and Mike Love wrote together. And remember, Mike did most of the lyrics. And, uh, you know, I know Mike Love, for example, is pilloried for being, you know, a difficult person. You can understand his frustration at not having been credited or indeed paid for all the lyrics that he wrote on some of those early songs. So, again, you've got a similar situation, although, you know, the initial idea would have come from either Andy or Colin. The four of us, or the three of us, as we turned, as we eventually became, (laughs) we'd all contribute. And the sound on what what ended up on the record was the sound of the band. Um, I was just going to say to Hugh, uh, in response to what Dave was just saying about about the level of detail that XTC had done before they even hit the studio. How, how and you were also talking about David Bowie coming into the studio with virtually nothing. How 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 common is it for a band to be as well rehearsed as that? Not as common as you would think is the answer, and I think Dave summed it up in in a way because budgets were always so tight and so many songs were wanting to be recorded that they you know they really did come in very well prepared compared to probably most other bands I work with to be honest so you know that's fantastic but I mean you could not do an album in a month like we used to do drums and wires and I don't think I don't think Black Sea was that much more than a month, was it, Dave? No, I think it was five weeks, I believe. Five weeks? Was that including the mixing? Yes. Yeah. Whereas Drums and Wires, I think it was four weeks including the mixing. That's right. And 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 typically, um, I ended up, say I was working on one of Sting's solo albums, I would mix one song a day. Mm-hmm. So if there was ten songs on the album, that was two weeks just mixing you know plus plus the two or three months recording before so to get everything done in f- four to five weeks you you couldn't be anything other than really well prepared just it just physically wouldn't wouldn't really be possible and i don't remember making any albums as quick as the albums that we did with xtc i can imagine that brings advantages and disadvantages like the, the the advantage of energy and speed and 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 directness and the disadvantage of maybe not being able to attend to some sort of details that you could find if you had a whole day to mix a song maybe but lis- listening to um black sea um it's 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 the the actual sonics and mixing and 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 side of it i mean it's really it's a sophisticated record it's not like a punk record where there's just two guitars bass and drums going all the way through every song you know it's really it's 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 i i i was impressed with myself actually well with everybody when i was listening to it the other day um you know pre pre um doing this podcast because there's there's a hell of a lot of intricacy and and uh, 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 in the arrangements and and the music and stuff. I've I've forgotten how how good it 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 is really in that respect because I think drums and wires was probably a bit sort of this this was definitely an adult version of drums and wires, wasn't it? Yeah. Would you agree, Dave? I would agree with that, and I think uh, drums and wires. It's, it's there's a naive quality to it that's 
part of its appeal for me. I can still enjoy listening to that record even even now, even though at the time I thought, well, he could have done a few things a bit better. But there's something nice about the, um, let's say, amateurish uh, uh, approach to it. But it was definitely a band who were, um, you know, struggling up the ladder. And I think Black Sea, we finally made it to the landing at least. Yes. And I think it's... Um, <sighs> Again, it had to be a record that we could produce live because half of uh, the, 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 what the band, you know, the money that uh, was being the band was making, was was produced by performing live, playing concerts and tours and touring uh, around the world, as it turned out for that for that particular year. So the record had to be performable, and that's. Andy and Colin certainly had that in mind when they were writing. That's another reason why it's fairly, uh, why, why, it, you know, the songs are the length they are, and and that's why there are so many of them, I suppose. Uh, but going back to saying, you know, when Hugh was saying we couldn't, you couldn't make a record like Black Sea in four or five weeks today. He's quite right about that because, of course, XTC ended up in mean, Oranges and Lemons. We were in the States for five months. And that record would have, in my opinion, been a, been a little bit easier on the ear had we not spent so much time on it. And so I think it's, um, you know, pros and cons to, uh, to, 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 to schedules. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Going back to the songwriting thing, we were talking about how it's credited to be um, Andy or Colin. Do you think, looking back on it now, I was using the example of Lennon and McCartney, and and because they they I don't think they ever wrote together, did they? But all the songs were Lennon and McCartney, and I don't know whose idea that was. And in retrospect, it seems unfair that your songs were were, um, you know, were public pub. What's the word? Published as. Andy, the songwriter, and and um, or Colin, the songwriter, when it really should have been the whole band, shouldn't it? Well, it should. But then again, you see, how would you feel had you come up with the original idea and uh, created most of the energy behind it, and suddenly you're having to share it with three other guys? Yeah, OK, they're playing on it. Uh, some bands are quite happy with that, like U2 and The Stranglers, I believe. They just went through and... Uh, you know, everything shared equally. After all, bands start with nothing, you know. They start with absolutely nothing. Everyone's happy to share nothing. And uh, then the debts come in. Everyone shares the debt equally. The debt is always shared equally. And uh, But when it comes to credit, people get very touchy. And uh, that's it could have it could have created some problems. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I can see that. You know, what I figured at the time for my, you know... I wasn't a songwriter. What few, what little bits of music I was writing didn't really fit the XTC vision. You know, when I say XTC, it's Andy and Colin, the way they saw life from, from their upbringing and their, their standpoint. Mine was slightly different. I was a year older and uh, I was more into, um, you know, kind of more traditional forms of rock music. And it wasn't until I joined the band that they, that my ears were fully opened to other alternatives. Um, but I would never, you know, take the credit away from those two guys as being, uh, you know, the, the spirit of, of XTC. <laughs> what was your favourite band at, well, at the time you joined XTC? At the time, it probably was Steely Dan. Well, the Beatles, of course, were always. But uh, I was always a huge fan of Todd Rundgren and Steely Dan and uh, Frank Zappa. Stevie Wonder, those kind of uh, mainly. It's, looking back, apart from the Beatles, most of them were American. So, so Dave, did it feel particularly strange for you then, being finding yourself in a band that was lumped in with, I don't know, the Buzzcocks and and the Sex Pistols and and the Undertones and all of the sort of new wave bands that were around at the time? It was a bit kind of well, we 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 kind of um, went off at a, a tangent, I think, after I joined because we weren't really a punk band anymore. I didn't think so. I didn't think there was very... There was a few sort of punky moments, like complicated game, I suppose, that could be described as punky because it was, you know, very angry and raucous and out there. But, but 
and noisy. <laughs> but we were getting more into straight pop, I think. That was what it was. We were playing pop music to a punk audience. And that what didn't fit very comfortably with a lot of people at the time. You could never say that XTC was a punk band, though. I don't think. I, I wouldn't have said so. You, can, you could probably listen to the 3D EP and say, well, yeah, it's punk in places. But it's, it's all rooted in good melodies and good songs. That's, that's really what's at the heart Exactly, of it. exactly. There weren't very many punk bands who could carry a tune. That was the, that was the difference. Um, and whatever, whether you like the music, whether you like XTC's music or not, it's always rooted in good melodies. I, I wonder whether I can throw the same question that Hugh just gave to Dave back to Hugh and say, you know, you as a producer or an engineer um, are also con contributing in the same way that Dave is contributing to, the, to, to the, the music that's being made. Do you think that you should have been credited more in the way that somehow, you know, sometimes someone like... Brian Eno would get a, a, a credit as a songwriter in, 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 in the um, album sleeve. No, I don't think so, because luckily in that era of album, uh, vinyl albums, there were actually sleeve notes that, that nine times out of ten, your name was on it as, as engineer. And that's how I got to learn. I mean, Dave was just talking about Steely Dan. That's how I got to learn who all the musicians were in Steely Dan, all the guest musicians were, and and uh, who the producers were. I I loved early Elton John records, and 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 that's how I learned that Gus Dudgeon was a producer, and 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 the guys who played in the band. So, um, I, I I don't have a problem because I would get gigs because people would like XTC record. Oh, let's see, you know, it sounds great or whatever. Look down on the on the record sleeve. Hugh Padgham engineered it. Um, we'll have him, please. So, um, I mean, I'm 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 being um, a little bit sort of flippant, but nowadays, if you if you stream. A, a song, even if it's an old song on Spotify or whatever, you haven't got a clue who played on it or who there's, there's and 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 very often CDs when they ended up coming out because they were small. I mean, there were obviously sleeve notes and things, but it gradually got worse and worse and worse. And then when iTunes came out with MP3s, and even when you were buying um, songs on iTunes, the the there was there was no information on them. I work, yeah. I work with a, an artist called Melissa Etheridge, who's like an American rock singer. And I did two records with her in the, in the nineties that were actually very successful in, in, in America. And she found me because she went to tower records with her manager and she was looking through all the racks in Tower Records and she would pick out the records that she really liked and would look at the um, credits on it. And my name came up more than more than others. And that's how I got to work with Melissa Etheridge. And Mark's got a question that's uh, related to this about producers. Um, it's, it's really about how the roles changed so much over the years. I mean, I'm talking to you now on a MacBook Pro with logic on it and loads of plugins and the ability to record this and everything, but it doesn't have apps for talent, creativity, or anything like that. So, but given the fact that home recording has changed so much and it's so available, how does the role of a producer and engineer have changed now these days? It's changed massively. Massively, it's why why most studios have gone out of business. And do you think that's a bad thing? I mean, I know the answer's going to be yes, but <laughs> obviously... Well, you know. it's a bad thing if you own a studio, but what, 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 what's, what's a good thing about it is that any kid who's talented and not got much money can go and buy a second-hand Mac or whatever, open it up and they've got GarageBand on it at the very least, he can make a record on it, whereas the era that... that we're talking about, you know, in the 70s, 80s or, or, or before that as well. The only place you could make a record really was in a, in a recording studio and that cost money. And therefore, you needed to be signed to a record label, whereas now you can do whatever you want at home 
which cost you nothing. But I think it, it does have its negative sides because everybody is now making records by, by, I'm not just talking about in coronavirus where we can't get together, but uh, uh, I've got a friend, Carlos Alomar, who plays with, um, uh, played on loads of David Bowie records. And for, for years now, he's, his gigs are people sending him files and he plays whatever they've asked him to play sort of thing um, and, and sends a file back. But he says it's terrible because there's no interaction with, with your comrades or people in, in the studio. So from that point of view, I think it's not good at all. Um, so, you know, like anything, I guess there's pros and cons, aren't there? I mean, there's a story, um, I don't know if it's true or not, about Duran Duran turning up at a Rolling Stones studio session and there's them looking at the band and saying, what are you doing? And Keith Richards saying, well, we're playing as a band because they all recorded the tracks individually. And so they're actually playing in the studio at the same time together. And I think the key thing to that is the dynamic between the players improvising with each other and playing with each other. And that's obviously what you lose by doing it remotely, especially these days with the technology. Yes, I, I, I think you're absolutely right, yeah. So, Dave, what's your preference? Does, does this affect you? Do you prefer to play in a room with other people or are you quite happy recording your piece onto a computer file and sending it off? No, if if the band's well rehearsed and they're used to playing together, you know, on a on a not necessarily a daily basis, but on a regular basis, yeah, I would say every time go to the studio and play together, at least for the backing track, just just to get the drums, bass, and rhythm guitars or whatever else it is, uh, and guide vocal, just to get a good feel, just so everyone's in love with the song before you start adding to it. Everyone knows exactly where it starts and finishes and all the parts in between. And you, yeah, provided everybody, it's a good studio, the room sounds nice, that's the best, that's that's the dream ticket. Do it like that. And then whatever additions need to be done, do it that way. And I think Drums and Wires was pretty much done that way. I think we were doing two or three basic tracks a day, weren't we, Hugh? It was very quick. Uh, yeah, it would be just bass, so. drums and uh, rhythm guitars, uh, guide vocal. The the other thing going back to what you would we were just talking about now about playing together in the studio, even though the drum tracks might have had uh, a metronome click in Terry's headphones going by nowadays because everything's recorded to a grid in Logic or Pro Tools and. Um, there's 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 no sort of movement in 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 the music or whatever. So if 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 somebody's sung a chorus, now they'll just copy and paste the chorus into every other chorus because it's quick and yes. it's instant and all that. But in in our days, or, or, or the you know the early eighties, um, you know, Black Sea era or whatever, you had to sing every single chorus separately. You had to do everything in every in, in every part of the song. So there was one guitar part that was, you know, the same in verse one or verse two, and and so all that makes things subtly subtly different. Um, I noticed when I was listening the other day in um, on to the songs there was um, the song "Love at First Sight," and there's an effect. On, on the vocal, he goes, love at first, sight, 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 you know, or sight. there's a big sort of echo thing on it. And like, the first one's really bold. And I thought, oh my God, that's a bit bold. And then the second one, it's not quite as bad, you know, not quite as bold. Is he looking for romance? It was all just sort of, you know, when we were mixing, it was like playing instruments as well again. So every time you did a mix or even when you're recording overdubs and or, or vocals or whatever, there's, there's every time is just different, even if it's minusculely different. It's, and it just makes for a whole 
that's the essence of the performance, though, isn't it? It's all, that's where the performance is, as as distinct from uh, you know uh, a production. And speaking of love at first sight, when you mentioned that echo on on that site, I can still remember to this day Terry Chambers having had a few beers after dinner. And you were mixing away. And he was slouched on the couch there at the back and, and he had a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. He's going, Hugh, Hugh, on that word, sight, 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 sight. <laughs> just, he was just gesturing with his fang. And, <laughs> and he kept saying it. And, we, and you were sort of trying to, you know, yeah, Terry, it's all right. We'll get to that in a minute. Don't worry. Hugh, sight, 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 sight. Oh dear, oh dear. So you don't get that now, you'd be thrown out of the studio for doing something like that. But I agree with you about cutting and pasting. I've I've developed a very fine ear for it. I can almost instantly spot it. And it's in most well, uh, modern music. It's also music. like auto-tune on vocals. Oh, I doubt if I doubt if there is a pop record now made that doesn't have auto-tune, even if it's only very subtly on it. Drives me nuts. It really does. Mark uses it on this podcast to make us sound better. (laughs) (laughs) You'll all be in tune at the end. Well, I gather now that uh, in modern recording contracts, what was I I listening to recently? Um, Oh, that's right. There was a a programme Yvonne and I were watching about the backing singers, 20 Feet from Stardom, I think it was called, and they were talking about modern recording contracts. And there's a clause now that um, uh, within the budget set aside for tuning. And uh, and the, the singers were somebody questioned this. What's this tuning clause in this budget? Oh well, we all have to do it. I have to factor it in. Once the vocals are done, then it's handed over to a technician to tune, and that can take weeks. For God's sake! I have to say that I, I am really pleased and happy that. I was kind of born when I was and got into the business when I did because I think it really was more of a golden era, that era of the 70s and 80s and and and, and stuff than, than it is now. Well, I think I just got in under the wire. You know, it was just the tail end of analogue recording just as digital was coming in. We were all very excited about digital recording. We couldn't wait to get our music on a CD. That was the way forward. Uh, now, I, you know, I can only listen to a CD maybe three or four times before I'm tired. And then, uh, you know, and you just realise, actually, you know, those old tape recorders did not sound good. Do you know what's what I find funny about getting a bit older now is when I started in the business aged 18 or... No, I would have been 19, actually, because I left school at 18. It took me a few months to get a job as a tape op in a studio. So I was 1974. And even when I got a job as a tape op, I thought that I had missed out on the best years of rock music. And if you look at, say, the, say, 54, you know, Elvis, that's kind of the period when Elvis and rock and roll, I'm not saying it, there weren't some records before, because there was rock around the clock and stuff but roughly around 20 years before I got in the bit you know I thought I was I missed out and it was only 20 years before so if if you then go from 1974 to 84 to 94 and now another 20 years on from that yes it's so amazing what the perspective absolutely Am I am I talking rubbish here? No, you're absolutely. This is spot on, Hugh. This is exactly how I look at it because I can remember thinking uh, in the late eighties when we were in LA making oranges and lemons that we were going to have all this music, two albums worth of music on one disc. That was fantastically exciting for us at the time. We couldn't wait to to hold <laughs> to listen to all this music in one place and not have to constantly be changing records. And so, uh, but then you know. You just start thinking, you know, this is kind of getting a bit hard on the ears now. I'm not sure that I, I like the sound of this record or anything that we've done since. It's just to, uh, you know, I wish we were back in the townhouse with a, in a nice room with a, with a tape recorder, a tape machines, mastering onto tape. Just you like know, it's so, it's so funny because um, CDs were 
were out of date when they first came out, the technology. Yeah. And it's so weird when you look at how um, audio has gone, got worse and worse and worse because CDs don't actually sound as good as a good vinyl LP. We know that now. And then, and then after CDs became MP3s, which also don't sound as good as a CD, which doesn't sound as good as a thing. Whereas in the parallel world of video, you've gone from black and white uh, television with 525 lines or something to now, you know, 4K Super HD. And it's like amazing. And it's like such a shame that, that for the most part, audio hasn't followed that. And then, and then the other thing is, in, in the days when we were making these XTC records, as far as I was concerned, there was a competition. I wanted our record to sound as good as Steely Dan's or as good as whoever's record, you know. It was a whole thing. And when I made records for A&M, um, such as the police and stuff, um, they, ha they had a quality control department. And... And to to not only see that the test pressings came back and sounded all right from from you know when they mastered the record, but also they A and M didn't really like releasing a record if it if it if it sounded rubbish, you know, sonically, and they had a very high, um, what's the word, threshold of sort of you know A and M were really good company, and now nobody ever talks about the sonic. Um, qualities of, of records, do they? I don't think. Have you heard the 5.1 mixes of Black Sea? Um, I have, but I, I, funnily enough, when I was talking to Dave the other day, um, I said that I've got two 5.1 setups here in my house that are more to do with TV, and I, I couldn't get them to, to sound good, I think is the answer. Um, which is probably I should have fiddled more with my thing, but then I thought, well, I've spent ages getting it, getting it um, sounding good for for telly or, or or films, and that's what worries me about five point one, is that how many people who are actually buying these discs do have a properly good, well set up five point one system you know i've got it but it takes about three hours to calibrate it all so as you say it's a nightmare yeah that's right and you need a room don't you and is it worth it in the end because the other thing that we were saying that i was saying to dave the other day is like oh we all want to remix our old records sometimes you listen to it like i was i, I was saying I, I i think the 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 vocal sounds a bit low on rocket from a bottle um what's it called yeah rocket from a bottle and and Dave was saying, no, no, because um, it, if you remix it again now, even if it's off analog tape, you're going to be using different sounding echo plates. You're going to be using different this, that and the other. I remember the first time this occurred to me was, um, I don't know about you, but I loved the doors when I was growing up. And in the mid 90s, I think, the um, Bruce... Botnik, I think he is the producer. He got the original tapes of some of these Doors albums and he remixed them with, um, he dubbed them over to digital, I think, and remixed them with pristine, you know, state of the art at the time, digital reverbs and things. And it really, it threw me because the music was the same, but it didn't sound the same. And it was like, it was like someone going like like that on your on, and it was like really weird. It was a bit like being put into an alien space where you were in a dream or something because the music was the same, but it didn't sound the same. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, because they wanted to use all the modern toys to make it sound better, but it just sounded yeah. different. And this was the problem. And no, I don't think it's better at all. And they did, you know, someone did a number on Free as well, another of my favourite bands in the mid 80s, and yeah. decided that they were going to, um, you know, modernise these lovely old grungy blues tracks. Great, great songs and great performances. And then they poured all this modern slop over it. And, they, and some people were raving about it. 
even members of the band were saying, oh, this is great. We didn't know this. there was so much in it, you know. No, you're just missing the point. And uh... iTunes um, came up with a random playlist for me um, based on my listening habits. And every single track on it, after the song title in brackets said 2016 Remaster. And I thought for a start, I'm all getting old because obviously I like music that's you know so old it's been remastered. But also, as you're saying, we're just foisted with this. You know, it's you take this new version with us with a bit more reverb, with a bit more compression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you kind of go, well, can I just hear the originals, please? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I was lucky enough to go to to what uh, Stephen Wilson invited me round to his house when he was uh, remixing a, a Yes album. I think it was close to the edge he was working on at the time. And uh, he said, look, I've got five different mixes of this album. Uh, here's the original analogue mix. He just played me a few bars of that. I said, there's nothing wrong with that. That sounds great. He says, yeah. He says, now listen to this. It's the first digitally remastered. And it, it just sounded dreadful. He said, all they've done is turn the treble and the bass controls all the way around to number 11. That's it. They call that a remaster. Because that's kind of expanded the bandwidth, which presumably was going to improve things. And he said, I'm just going to do a flat transfer and uh, see if anyone notices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's usually a marketing ploy, isn't it? You know, a new format comes out and it's like the record company goes, oh, wow, yeah, this is great. You know, we'll re-release it and, and call it something else, you know, on the new format. That happened a lot with CDs. Yes, it did. Yes, I mean, anything, any CD that says digitally remastered, you can usually be uh, pretty sure it's been digitally fucked up. <laughs> so, Dave, have you heard the 5.1 mixes of a Black Sea? I've heard snippets of them. Uh, Yvonne has a 5.1 set up in her living room. But really, you need a proper room to hear the stuff properly. It's no point in just scattering a few speakers in, in the corners of your, of your dining room. You need a proper, or you know, sound. I, I, I personally, you know, I, I still struggle with stereo sometimes. I like, you know, I just like to hear music in a room coming out of a, a single source. That's good enough. That's near enough for me. If the songs are, and the playing is, and the performances are good, I reckon, and I'm not sure, but this is what I reckon: that ninety percent of people, me included. If I'm listening to an album when I'm cooking or something like that, I've got Spotify, Bluetooth to a little Bowers and Wilkins boom box or whatever it might be, you know, whatever it is. And it's a mono source. I mean, it is supposedly stereo, but you, you I don't think most people have left, right speakers six feet of, apart from each other all the time anymore. So, so, and, and that's kind of what I'm used to now. And if I'm playing um, an old Aretha Franklin record or something, it just, it sounds great because these boom boxes are, uh, ma uh, uh, um, they're, they're, they're sort of, what's the word I'm thinking of? That they're, they're designed to make MP3s sound good. You know, if you, if you put a really good, amplifier and, and turntable and stuff through them it, it, it wouldn't sound good so they're maximized or optimized that's the word I'm trying to think of to make mp3 sound good and that's why I think you know with all respect to Stephen Wilson because I think he's really good he's an amazing musician he's a really nice guy bloody bloody blah, blah, blah I just I just think it's a bit of a waste of time to be honest doing these 5.1 um, remixes it's just wanking off, really, isn't it? Well, there are audio files out there who value them. Plus, you know, you do get an awful lot of extra stuff that comes with the 5.1. No, that's true. That That is true. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not saying they shouldn't exist, but I, I think I would have a hard time having worked on the original to re... You know, it's good that there's someone like Stephen around because he's really good at doing them as well. And he's the go-to man, isn't he, for these 5.1 things now. So how do you feel about the extra tracks being on there? Is, is there a certain sense of it wasn't on the album for a reason? Or is, are you glad to see it all come out? Or in the Hughes case, do you think, oh, that's OK, but it could have done a bit more work for some of the stuff that's on there? Well, as long as they're, you know, as long as people know their demos, 
or rehearsal tracks or whatever it is, that's fine. Uh, I don't think anyone familiar with the uh, original album is ever going to be fooled by the fact that uh, there, there, were, there were other songs finished to the same standard. Although to give a hand here, you know, with the XTC stuff, a lot of the bonus tracks that he's remastered in his shed or, or just, you know, tidied up, sound pretty good to me, I have to say. I, was, I was sort of think they're really worth having, for the fans at least. You know, I don't think any of them are going to be, um, you know, making any anyone... It, it, they're not going to be making him a lot of money, but it's nice to know that they exist and that uh, there are fans out there who'd enjoy them. And, you know, certainly, I think when the, certainly from the Skylarking album, I do remember there were some tracks... He had uh, half a dozen songs that we'd sort of half worked on that I'd completely forgotten about. I hadn't heard since uh, they were thrown out at the time. <laughs> and uh, I said, are you sure this is me playing on it? I don't recognise this. I don't even remember the song. You know, it's definitely you. So uh, there's an element of surprise, even for, even for me, uh, having having been there at the time and not heard them for 30 years. It was, uh, yeah, quite quite a quite a surprise and nice to know that they're there you know I'm just thinking you know it, when when black sea is mentioned what comes to mind in your sort of your musical ear or your 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 mind's ear or your mind's eye do you think of a particular track or even a particular sound yeah it, it probably does actually uh, the anvil in towers of london exactly same with me. Same with me. I, I can <laughs> I can remember like it's in like a photograph in my mind now the the the, the studio and the anvil being there and and um, yeah I mean that's that's that would be the one that really really yeah the, that that's making me think as well because of what you were talking about before about the idea of the band coming in really well rehearsed and and having the songs tight there was still the opportunity within the studio within the rehearsal. Uh, within the within the recording process to add something like an anvil or a fire extinguisher or, or whatever it might have been, so there was it was still a creative process yeah. in the studio. Is that, yeah. is that fair to say? I think so. I can't. Um, I don't remember the answer to that question. So you might. No, actually, I don't know how it came about. I'm sure it would have been Andy's idea, because you know he had the. <clears throat> it would have been one of the details he would have wanted to include in a song about building. And so uh, it was a question of what we were going to use to create the sound of this uh, pickaxe or whatever. I think that was the idea, wasn't it? it was, um... Well, what about you, Dave? When somebody mentions Black Sea, what mental image do you get in your mind's eye or your mind's ear? Um, just, again, that little... The control room in Studio 2 and the couch at the back and uh, the machines. It was quite a small space. And the, the rock, the rocks in the wall, you know, with... A, one it is worth built into. Of, of, of the stone drum room. Oh, no, the, in the control room. In the control room. The and then, of course, the glass doors into the stone room, that little live room, which is where the, all the magic happened. Um, yeah. Can no, you I've believe got... it? They, the, before Virgin closed the townhouse down completely, they got rid of that stone room. Oh. Uh. And they and they made they made an, a, a they got rid of the stone room and the control room and they made one big control room. They said, "Oh, we don't need that room anymore." Oh, for goodness' sake! I know who's in charge these days. Uh, historic England would probably slap an order on that, and you you, you can't touch it anymore because it's part of history. But uh, well, I mean, what if they did something like that at Abbey Road? Block of flats now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh no, it's heartbreaking, and I don't know what's what's happened to the manor. Because that, uh, what a, we couldn't, I could hardly think of a more perfect recording environment. You know, everything about the place was conducive to being creative. They had a great uh, a couple of rooms there in the studio and, uh, and the house was lovely. How on earth could that be allowed to be, uh, convert, what is it now, uh, some conference centre or something? No, I think it's a private house. Mm. But, you know, the year EMI closed the manor down, they'd just had their most successful year ever. Oh, it's mind-boggling. I don't know who's, who takes these decisions or why, but, uh, you know, it's a real shame. It's a bit like the story I heard that um, they were considering, EMI were considering moving out of the studios in Abbey Road um, to a place uh, called Hornsey Road, where there was a... a um, I think yeah, th there was already an established. Um, it was it a concert hall or a, a, a? That's right. Yes, 
it was a it was a place they'd bought uh, years earlier, wasn't it? For some as some auxiliary um, recording or rehearsal space or anything. Yeah. Right? It was just a little place, like you say, in Hornsey Road. I only found out about it a couple of years ago. Right, and this was prior to uh, the recording of Abbey Road by the Beatles, so uh, it could have well have been called Hornsey Road. Yeah, could have been. Thank goodness it wasn't. Yeah, I don't know whether there's a zebra crossing outside, though. <laughs> Hugh, I'm just um, thinking about the, the that amazing drum sound that you got now that we're talking about the stone room. Drum and bass, really. When you listen to Black Sea, even more than drums and wires, it's just got such a full, rich... I mean, it's partly Terry's playing, but it's also just that sound. And then, of course, you're associated then with what you went on to do with uh, in the air tonight with Phil Collins, and the story is told about how you how you develop that gated reverb sound. But but it seems to me that the the sound your your ideas were coming from as early as drums and wires, and definitely in in, in Peter Gabriel three and, Bla- and 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 Black Sea is was it was did it feel like a, a one step at a time for you in your in your development of that sound? Um... Well, I'm just looking at my notes here because I did Peter Gabriel's album where we first sort of, inverted commas, discovered this sort of gated big drum sound sort of thing, even though we'd used the room in drums and wires. But the, the you know, what I call the vicious side of it with using noise gates as well was on The Intruder, which is the first song on Peter Gabriel's third album, which Dave came and played some guitar on as well. It was after that record that I did In the Air Tonight and that, so they were both in between the year in between finishing drums and wires and doing Black Sea. So I had already done in the air tonight, or you know, or, or the whole of Phil's first album called Face Value before we did Black Sea. If I'm, if I'm, if I think I'm correct in that. Yeah, I think maybe the release dates were different to the recording dates, but it was yeah. Well, no, because I've got here. Um, uh, Drums and Wires released August 79. Peter Gabriel's third solo album released um, the end of May 80. Face Value uh, uh, released February 81. And Black Sea was... Oh, yeah, hang on. I've got this the wrong, wrong way around. Black... Black... Oh my God. Even, even your dog disagrees with your, your timeline. <laughs> hang on. Yes, I've got this wrong because... A Black Sea was released in September '80. Yeah, but hang on, now I'm confused because Black Sea was released qu- qu- quicker, if you see what I mean, from having finished the recording than Face Value because Face Value I've got here was re- recorded between June '80 and December '80. And this is what Dave and I were talking about the other day. Black Sea was recorded in the middle of my Phil Collins sessions. So that that sound was was seeping from one album to the other. There, it was all. Yeah, it was all. I mean that that Stone Drum Room. You know, I mean, it made my career. Yeah, of course, it did. Really, it's paid the rent ever since. It's paid the milkman <laughs> ever since. <laughs> You can imagine I was mortified when it when when they knocked it down. And and did it was it a conscious was it was it like like one step at a time were, were you did you have an idea of where you wanted to take that sound to is it just No, not really. It's just it 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 was just, you know, whatever fits the song really, I suppose, I think. I mean, the one thing with with the um if you're going for the brutal what I say, you know, the really heavily compressed thing that was on the intruder and in the air tonight that sound does not work with cymbals. So as soon as you put a drum kit in there and you've got cymbals and hi-hats, it just starts going... <laughs> it just starts going completely crazy. So if if you're doing a drum kit in there, like we would have been with, you know, Terry playing the whole lot, you had to tame it down a bit, but it was still still a great sound. I mean, my... I don't know about you, Dave, but my favourite song, I think, on on Black Sea is no language in our lungs. Ah, oh, yeah. 
sounds great and I love the guitars everything on that song I love it might not be a single but it's, I think it's my favorite song on on the album I mean I love yeah, I, I agree I love a lot of the other songs but that's a that's a really good example of the drum kit in that room it's got space to hear it there aren't too many symbols and stuff like that I mean occasionally we would try not with XTC but with other bands recording the drum kit but without cymbals or hi-hat. And, you know, it never really works. It's not the same, you know, and drummers don't like doing that either. No, that's right. No, I agree with you about no language. And what I particularly like about it is the tension in it. It's just a real, it never releases until the very last chord. You know, it's just building and building very, very slowly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, without blowing my own trumpet or anybody else's. It's a it's a great performance from everybody. Yeah, it really is. And like, I was thinking as well when you were saying earlier, Dave, about the songs being built to be played on, on the road, uh, which is true, but it's also true to say that these were hugely ambitious songs and if you were really just going out, out and play, you know, a, a, a set of hit singles in as if it was the early 60s or something then you wouldn't have written a song like no language in our lungs it's a it's a, an adventurous unusual uh subtle it's not boy meets girl it, it it goes it does it goes to places where you don't really expect so there was there's really fascinating i don't know if you'd call it attention but an, a, an ambition within the, within all of the the the, the 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 music on that record yeah we all had you know, every record we made, we all had this sort of uh, unwritten rule that the next record had to be better than the previous one. We were always pushing ourselves. In fact, thinking back, I think the band was um, probably the single most important thing in all of our lives for a good 15 years. You know, to the expense of even family life, I would, I, I would suggest. We just, that's all we thought about. How are we going to uh, get the best out of this, out of these, these new songs? Who's going to produce the next album? Where should we go with this? We're always thinking progressively and um, pushing ourselves. And Andy was very good at, uh, <laughs> you know, if you played something you didn't like, he'd let you know. And that's quite important. You know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be too mealy mouthed when you're, if you've got ambition, you know, you need to be uh, laying down the, laying, laying down the law and keeping people on, on message at all times. So that was very much in all of our minds. How, how, how good can we make this particular song? And will it, will this, will the finished record be better than the previous one? I think that was very much borne out by the progression of albums throughout the eighties with um, XTC, because the evolution album after album was very marked, wasn't it? Yeah, I agree. And uh, I think, as Andy pointed out on the on the um, This Is Pop television documentary that came out a couple of years ago, you know, we were one of the few bands that actually did keep that momentum building over time. One of, one of the two bands is what he said. <laughs> one of the two, yes. No, that, that was a bit naughty of him. I can think of uh, plenty of other bands that... Uh... Can I just ask about the, the last track, Travels... I'm probably pronounced it wrong. Travels of Nylon.
Um, I mean, was that always intended to be the final song on the album? I mean, the ending of it is one of those that really does benefit from 5.1 because you really do feel in the middle and there's a definite sense of it building up and up and you being in the center of it all. It's, you can, it's hard to think of any other song on the album being the final song because at the end of that, you just feel that's it, it's done. Was that always the intent? And from a production point of view, was it kind of, did you chuck everything in to get that effect, to make it the last track? It was just uh, very, I, actually, that's the other one I love on that album. Uh, I think it is the perfect closure, closer. And the, the idea was it just had this sort of demonic, uh, dark, evil thing about it, uh, just propelled by these tom, this tom-tom rhythm that Terry played. And this ostinato guitar riff going right the way through it didn't change uh and it just rolled rolled forward deeper <laughs> into this dark place i thought yeah. it was glorious and i know we had this sort of <laughs> i remember if you remember this hugh but we had this idea that wouldn't it be great if we get kate bush to howl some background vocals over the of these last choruses <laughs> and steve was saying oh shall i give her a call and we were going yeah go on <laughs> But of course, it never happened. But uh, that was one of the many silly fantasies we had uh, during the making. Yeah. Of well, you, you couldn't really have followed that song with much, could you? So it had to be at the end of one of the sides. I'm, I'm imagining Love at First Sight coming straight after Travels in the Hill on it. <laughs> it just never could have worked, could it? <laughs> no. Uh, and uh, Hugh, Hugh, maybe could you say something about working with Terry Chambers? Because I know that he regarded working with you and Steve is very important for him because it felt like on Drums and Wires and, and well, I suppose the three albums you worked on, uh, English Settlement and, and Black Sea, that the, the, the sound of the drums was given, you know, a, a prominence that he as a drummer really appreciated. Was, was he a, a, good, a good drummer to work with? Yeah. Terry, he, 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 was, he was, I just adored Terry. Well, I still, I mean, I still do. He's, he's not like he's... Not around, but he did disappear to Australia for a long time, actually. And um, anyway, um, yeah, Terry, he was absolutely hilarious all the time. And he was even more hilarious. When we, when we got to the end of a day, he was the man who went round to the off-licence, which was just round the corner from the townhouse, and he'd get his six-pack of whatever it was he was... McEwan's Export. Is that what it was? Good Scottish brew. And he'd get his, he'd get his six-pack of beer and he'd sit down at, at, at the um, back of the studio, as Dave was saying before, and as it, the more cans he drank, the more, the more vociferous and outrageous he got. But give him his dues, he, he would only have a drink when it was finished. And he was, he was the human drum machine, really, because not only in terms of keeping time, but Andy would suggest these ridiculous patterns for um, Terry to play. And Terry would just play them as if it was sort of second nature to him. And some of those drum patterns were way out there and difficult uh, to, to play. So his, his chops if that's the right word, were, were, were you know, very good, very good. And, and um, he was a, a unique a unique drummer and um, XTC, as Dave was saying before, everybody put their, their two penny worth in. And um, that, that's what made the band sound like the band really, isn't it? Yeah. And they do really sound, XTC sound like clockwork on that yeah. album. You know, all of the parts are so finely put together. For instance, we're talking about um, Terry and then the other, part of the rhythm section was was um, Colin on bass. And I would never have employed Colin as a session bass player. For instance, you would never sort of go, oh, well, I think I'll get Colin to come and play bass on, on Phil Collins' album or something. But he was a truly excellent bass player. And he, he, he played in a... I mean, I don't think he ever knew that he was good, or maybe he did. I mean, he had he had a a, a very um, interesting sound. He would often be playing sort of strange looking basses, wouldn't he, and stuff. And his bass lines really were were excellent. And when I was listening to the record again the other day, it's like bloody hell. He, very underrated, I think. Actually, you know, bass bass lines. 
very, very good. But I think that's his melody side of things coming through because he was the one who sort of ended up writing the more sort of melodious, um, if that's the right word, singles, wasn't didn't he really, Dave? Oh, very much so. He's got a brilliant ear for melody. And like you say, I, I think... Um... His bass playing is sorely underrated. It's a big part of the band's sound and people don't, until you listen for it, you don't yeah. really know uh, what's going on down there. And also, he didn't he didn't have particularly a twangy sound, you know, like, 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 um, um, you know, what's his name in, in, in The Who? John Entwistle, yeah. John Entwistle, who sometimes when you listen to Who records, you don't know if it's a guitar or bass. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 um, Colin played what I call old-fashioned bass, which was like no top at all. It was like all oh, you know, low end, and and sometimes I I wonder whether I made the best fist of it now. But um, you know, I think it, it's all right. I mean, I I uh, found this compressor a few years ago, maybe ten years ago now, which I really wished I'd had at the time. It's called a Gates Stay Level, and it's a, a valve compressor from the fifties, and it makes bass just sound great and it and 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 it, it, you can have that sort of muffy or woolly sound even but it will still sound clear in the mix it's just one of those bits of equipment that is just magic you know finding the right a good bass sound that's really really difficult for me anyway at least I've, that's the thing i've always struggled with just recording at home yeah. getting the bass in the right place but i remember hugh Colin had that Epiphone Newport bass. That's right. It just yeah. had one pickup on it and right next to the fingerboard. It was a really fluffy sounding thing, and you were tearing your hair out. So, this bass sound, it's all EQ. <laughs> I can't do anything with it. And uh, then I think he added a, a DiMaggio pickup at the other end, and that improved slightly. But yeah, I know you did struggle with it at times. Yeah. And then he had another strange bass, didn't he? He had some, it was like, was it an Ampeg or something, which had a sort of scroll top to it? No, no. I think he must be thinking of someone else there. But he he did have this Epiphone, which was uh, was like a medium scale thing. Uh, You don't see too many of them. And uh, eventually he did buy a precision bass. He had a Mustang, a Fender Mustang bass for drums and wires. Yes, I that was the other that. thing. That's the first time I remember you were mixing uh, Rhodes Girdle the Globe, and you'd soloed the bass track, and I'm listening to this ridiculous. What? Where's? What's this? What's he doing? What's he playing? I couldn't. It was the first time I'd actually heard Colin's bass in solo mode. In, in you know. Clearly, yeah, and the bass line to Rhodes Girdle the Globe. You try and figure it out. Anyone who's, who plays bass out there, go and figure that bass line out. It's ridiculous. It's a bit of a cliche, probably, but I worked with this reggae band once, and the guy was 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 um, the bass player. He just he, he, he you know with with reggae stuff, they always want more and more bass. He said, "Hey man." Stop mucking up! Stop mucking! I can't do a, a, a accent. I want maximum bass at all frequencies. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember any kind of things that didn't work in the studio? When you was it was it a smooth process? Were the things that um, some songs that caused you problems or that you couldn't get were difficult to get right? I think it was relatively smooth, um, because of the um, well-rehearsed nature of the band that we were talking about. The, we didn't really have that much room for error, um, if you see what I mean, or, or, or time for error. I think um, occasionally there might have been something like Andy's guitar amp didn't work very well, but Dave would be better better. Uh, that I kind of remember what I liked doing was having Dave's guitar on the left and Andy's guitar on the right, so that they were very much um, you could you could hear each part of them very succinctly. Did Andy ever have problem with his equipment with his amps? Yes, he did. And actually, there was one song on Black Sea. I can't remember what it was now. I think it was something like Living Through Another Cuba, and I couldn't work out. The guitar's just in the middle, 
And I don't understand why. But I think often, if I'm right in saying Andy would play his Gibson Les Paul or whatever, and you would try and counter that by playing maybe a Fender guitar. So it would be a quite, a, you know, a different sound. So we could, you, you know, you weren't stepping on each other sonically as well. And by having one guitar on the left and one guitar on the right in the stereo mix generally was really good because you could, you could listen to the parts, you know, separately and, 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 and you know, hear it. It was a, sort of a very good sonic arrangement, I think. I always, even now, I'm always listening to all the other instruments on the track, see which guitar is, is not going to fight with anything else, you know. So find a guitar that sounds slightly different or is complementary but different. And, uh, and use that rather than um, have too much of the same kind of signal going onto tape. But certainly, yes, uh, there would be, um, you know, Andy tended to have a very abrasive tone. Uh, yeah. It's very rhythmic, though. He's a really fantastic rhythm player. But yeah. it would be, you know, very spiky. <laughs> and I yeah. would try and smooth that out sometimes. What do you call that noise? Was it, um, is it Love at First Sight that's got that fantastic one note solo, isn't yes. it? Yes. I mean, who could play a. I presume that was him that played it. It was. But who who could play a solo that only had one note? Andy Partridge. I used to love when we played that on stage. He would uh, he'd grab the chord and he'd and he'd jump up and down, you know. And and of course he'd have a long uh, cable coming out of his guitar, curly lead. And sometimes he'd turn around as he was jumping up and down with this chord bam back it gradually gets faster and faster and he'd spin around so by the time the solo finished he'd have his legs completely wrapped up in a guitar <laughs> cable and one of those curly leaves and uh, he'd be stuck there you know he couldn't move but that always used to make me laugh <laughs> What, I'm just thinking, uh, there's, we've, we've talked about drums, we've talked about guitars, we've talked about bass, uh, we haven't talked about vocals. Was was uh, anything to be reflected on there? Well, not being a singer, I've got to hand that over to Mr. Padge because he's uh, <laughs> he was in charge of making sure uh, that it all kind of I, went in tune. I can't really... Um, I can't... You know, vocals are vocals, aren't they? And, and vocalists are, you know, usually a pain in the ass. But um, in 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 terms of Andy, I don't I don't remember any problems at all. I mean, he knew what he was singing. He'd written the lyrics. You know, that's usually the problem in the studio. You know, the singer hasn't finished the lyrics and he doesn't know what he's singing. Or he's changing the melody or something. I think it was all pretty, you know, like everything else, pretty well worked out. And it was just a question of of you know, getting, I, I would imagine probably most of the songs were probably all sung on the same microphone going through the same compressor and, and, um, uh, um, and, and that was it really from, from, a, from an actual recording point of view. Um, like I said before, some of the songs, particularly um, rocket from a bottle to me the vocal sounds a bit buried but I, do, I do, that was that's more of a mixing thing and I was wondering if I maybe maybe I didn't mix that song but I probably did I don't know uh, this is reminding me of what David Yazbet said to me in what do you call that noise about burning with optimism's flames the, the thing that got me I still remember this it's very clear in my mind it's as clear as the first time I ate Indian food you know like it because it was a kind of a mind, a, a, a mind fucker, yeah, you know, in a yeah. way, was the the lyric specifically, and it comes right near the beginning of the song um, when he goes and like some aurora from her head, she's throwing mm -hmm. through the ground and all around like an Navajo blanket. Never seen her going, all that bright she's throwing like some aurora from her head is growing, reaching to the so two things happened in my head when I heard that, the, the uh, reaching to the ground and all around like an Navajo blanket. 
it was this combination of this feeling of this melody, the sung melody, literally doing what the lyric is doing. The mm-hmm. lyric is saying, reaching to the ground and all around like a Navajo blanket. And, you know, like I know what a Navajo blanket looks like. I, 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 I have Navajo blankets. You know? <laughs> and, and, and back then I knew, I knew, because my girlfriend was from, was from uh, New Mexico. But also, the, the melody is literally going down. It's reaching to the ground. And then it goes on a little too long, a little longer than you expect. And because it does that, the Navajo blanket's on the ground. You know, the part, part of it is on the ground. So it's just like that was, to me, I know that that was a major influential two bars of music for me. What do you call that noise? But for me, you know, talking about the vocals, Andy is one of the best lyricists ever in 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 um, contemporary music. I'm co- absolutely convinced. You know, as far as I'm concerned, he's up there with Bob Dylan. You know, I mean, not from a poetical point of view, but just just the the uh, you know, uh, he's just he's he's a genius, really. I mean, he's brilliant. Yeah. Hope he's not listening to this. Oh, you will be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking about the process in the studio, um, uh, saying about, you know, there's, there's a lot of waiting round for musicians and then they get to do their bit, then there's a lot of waiting round. And, um, it's a very uncreative, unmusical process sometimes when you're trying to find what's what's the main, where the main hum's coming from or... Uh, we're, yeah, putting gaffer tape on snare drums and that kind of thing. Um, do you have any comments on that? The sort of the uncreative, unmusical side. No, I think you know. First of all, as we've discussed earlier, we we didn't have time to spend a day getting a a, a bloody drum sound or a snare drum sound. Um, but with all good musicians, they all know how to present their instrument well. So if you're a great drummer. If you're a really good drummer, the likelihood is that your drum kit will sound good, and that's the same with with everybody else apart from 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 Colin's Epiphone bass or whatever. But um, so that that is not a problem, uh, and and we did we didn't have time or the money to spend um, a lot of time um, fiddling around with sounds. We wanted to get good sounds. We didn't we didn't skimp, but in terms of um, the other part of your question is if you're going to make a record in five or six weeks, there's only one way to make it. And you've got to sit, you, you, you play all the backing tracks together. You can't play all the parts necessarily in the backing track. So often guitars would then be added on. And then, um, although more laterally synthesizer parts, do you remember your Korg synths and, and things like that? And, and, and then, and then when when the overdubs are done pretty well is when you do vocals and the vocals would more or less be done in a block as well. And of course, it's much easier and quicker rather than necessarily swapping around the whole time. And I'm pretty sure that's how, how you know, we did it, isn't it, Dave? It was quite regimented in terms of the, the backing track sessions, the guitar overdubs any other overdubs and then singing. Yeah, I would have I liked more time overdubbing guitars because we got no time at all. You know, they were kind of um, secondary to the drums and vocals. They were the most important things for Andy. Uh, but um, so, so any opportunity you had to uh, to play guitar, you, you better be on it and make sure you did it quickly yeah i think i think we spent a bit more time on guitars and things on english settlements yeah. actually because we we were up at the manor and when you're in a london studio you've got a sort of 12 hour day probably and um very often you guys would did you go home every night or some no did you stay uh, at the studio no we we were staying at the townhouse okay but when we were at the manor it's sort of almost like a 24 hour session if you want it to be you're not paying you're paying by the week not by right. not by the day yeah. or by the hour yeah. so we did indulge ourselves a bit more i believe on english settlement with guitar sounds and things 
True enough. You know, but that's that's another podcast. That's a brilliant yeah, album so as well. That, that another anniversary, maybe. Another anniversary. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, we're going to be old anniversaries. I mean, that was uh, you know, Hugh, you were talking earlier about that sense, that weird sense of time as all of us get older and realizing that. You know the history of rock and roll is getting older and older, but uh, when you do, when you listen back to to to, to Black Sea this week, do, uh, uh, d- d- does it feel like a, a, a an old album or a contemporary album, a new album? Or no, it doesn't. It, that that's the weird thing. It does does not feel forty years ago, and it it just stands up for me as as a bloody good band and a good album. You know, as 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 far as I'm concerned, pretty well most. XTC albums. I mean, obviously, I know the albums that I made with the band, which was three, better than the other ones, and 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 I do love some of the al- other albums, but I would n- never know them quite as intimately. Perhaps I should spend more time. But no, I mean, the answer to your question is, I don't think it has. Uh, uh, it doesn't sound old fashioned to me at all. Sometimes. You 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 go. Oh my God! I wouldn't have done that now. For instance. Um, well, although I don't think it applies to this one, what what's the song, Dave? That we've got. Do you remember synth drums were just coming in, weren't they? Love at first sight. It's love at first sight. Yeah, there we go. That song again, and it's got this, you know, synthesized snare drum. But even that doesn't sound too bad. But when I hear some of the stuff I did with Genesis, for instance, in the mid '80s, where Phil was going mad on the uh, electronic drum drum kit it was sort of I think it's a bit cringe worthy to me and it really does sound it's a bit like mullets you know they don't really they haven't <laughs> they haven't sort of worn well have they they haven't weathered the passage of time too well yeah but I I, I as far as I'm concerned that record Black Sea still sounds current or well, it's, it's certainly it's it's it, it stands the the test of time, I believe. I think there's something about XTC because XTC were never fashionable in the first place. That they sort of transcend time. That they're not they're not so linked in with any one era or sound or whatever. That, that it means that the that the the, the the albums have a longevity. That yeah. maybe if something was I don't know Kajagoogoo, where you could say that can only be the the, the era that it yeah. came from. I mean, I still meet industry people, whether they be executives or whatever. That's there's, there's, there's not that many people who know their music who don't know XTC and who don't know XTC and don't like XTC. And you can say that after somebody who's who's worked with you've mentioned them already. You know some of the greatest or most popular, most famous people in in, in popular music. It's a, it's a it's a very high up on my CV. Put it like that. Well, you know, <clears throat> I think we were just very very lucky to have found. Each other than you, because those those three albums that we did with you, you know, they are game changers, certainly for the band. You know, we went from uh, being this little punk outfit from Swindon into uh, one of the big boys. Yeah. Well, you're very complimentary to say that, but I wouldn't have. You wouldn't be on my high up on my CV if you hadn't all been as great as you were as well. So, you know, we we we're all. You know, it's one of those things, isn't it? Just lucky to be in the right place at the right time that we all met up. You know. That's right. No, I I agree with that. I think that's uh, that's one of the reasons why you know we we can reflect fondly on these records because. We were just the right age. Things were happening just the right time. A um, lot of changes going on in music generally. Um, we just happened to be, it's just a shame we didn't sell as many records as some of the other guys. Yeah, yeah. And I, and also, I think, listening back to the, to, to the um, records now, because we were all in our, you know, mid-20s, more or less, weren't we? To have that sophistication of playing, writing, um, l- lyrics and and you know from my side of things sonics as well at, at being such an early age you know quite re- relatively early age I mean I I don't hear much contemporary stuff now played by twenty somethings that is sounds very good to 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 me you know I mean even great singers like. Adele, if you like Adele or something, you listen to the lyrics. They're crap. You know, Ed Sheeran is absolute rubbish, you know. Um, I love you, you love me. I mean, it's, you know, it's 
not much better than that, is it? That's true. But then even so, just hearing a melody on the radio nowadays is quite rare. Most yeah. of it is, you know, I must admit, this techno stuff is just, just I don't know what people are listening to. Why would you, why, why would you choose to listen to that? <laughs> I know. Now we really are beginning to sound like old fogies. <laughs> we are. We are. But we're entitled to, God damn it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm a pensioner now. <laughs> got a good beat I'm, i deserve to be grumpy I, I i'm really enjoying this conversation and don't want it to stop but i'm aware of the, the the length of the podcast and feel that i should say thank you very much to everybody we can continue talking anyway but thank you very much uh to everybody and happy birthday black sea thank you for 40 years of entertainment that i've been having it is put it's it's dating me as well <laughs> as as everybody else and uh thank you uh david rice and 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 Mark Reed, and of course, thank you very much for Hugh Padgham and Dave Gregory. I know it was it was it was a pleasure to be invited. And I, I've got a feeling this is my first podcast. I think actually, oh, is it? Yeah, I'm a podcast virgin. Or well, I was. so am I. I. This is my first podcast. I've done a couple of Skypes, but this is the first podcast. Yeah. And thank you, the listeners, to XDC Podcast. What do you call that noise? See you next time. What do you call that noise?